This week I'm joined once again by Bob Dobbs, who was Marshall McLuhan's archivist and is a renegade McLuhan scholar. In this second episode on the work of Marshall McLuhan, I discuss further McLuhan-esque ideas alongside a long discussion on Dobbs' work with Ion. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermitics and access exclusive content and very much help the podcast keep going indefinitely, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, enjoy. So, Bob Dobbs, uh, thanks for coming on to Hermetics once again for part two on Marshall McLuhan. Um, as we sort of said, you know, we had this big long list of questions. We've sort of touched on some, so there might possibly be some overlap in this 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 part, but that's sort of unavoidable because everything McLuhan's doing is completely entwined, and the, you know the circuit the circuitry is a big system. This chaotic leviathan. So I'm just going to jump in, but with basically the first question, I don't think we really got into the nitty and gritty of last time, which is, uh, you know. McLuhan notices that everything's sort of sculpted in the media, you know, our identities are formed, everything we're, we're buying into is, um, you know, formed in some way by some other or, you know, the, the French continentals would call it desire of the other, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But what interests me is that McLuhan does explicitly talk about propaganda many times, but does he really, does he differ between what, how he understands propaganda and how we commonly understand propaganda? Like, is everything for him propaganda? Uh, no, but the, the understanding of his version of propaganda is the key to McLuhan. So he he used to uh, quote Jacques Ellul, E-L-L-U-L, -L -L, mm -hmm. who did a book in uh, 65 or so on propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes, I think was the subtitle. And Ellul made a simple statement. He said, propaganda is not the messages or what McLuhan would call the content uh, in the culture. The propaganda is the culture and all that it's made up of, basically it's machines in the 20th century. The whole operation is propaganda, the whole action of the culture and its technologies. So McLuhan turned that into a poetic art form uh, where he said the medium or the technologies is the message, the massage, the mess age and the mass age. So medium is massage broke up to mass age, medium is the message broke up to mess age. So four lines. And uh, he worked on all those levels. And so he stressed in the 60s, that the, in the 50s and 60s, that we're missing what television is going to do to us as a form on our senses and on previous media. You can't just bring the TV in your house and, you know, as a Christmas present for your kids in 1955 and uh, think nothing's going to happen <laughs> that's going to upset you because the kids are going to change their sensory makeup, the younger kids, especially who grow up with it. So he tried to say in the 50s, 60s, emphasize that the medium is the massage. And uh, people thought that he uh, was exaggerating and missing the point of ideas and content brainwashing people. He said, that's trivial. The brainwashers are subject to the changes television or satellites are gonna bring in. It's gonna change their kids, gonna make them all junkies, you know? And, uh, you know, when, uh, Queen Elizabeth's got the same problem. So in the seventies, he brought in the other aspect and he said, it's the user is the content. When you uh, watch, uh, read a poem, you're bringing your own experience and your conditioning to the conditioning of the poet and the two meet and there's an intermingling, but it's an important factor is to stress the user is the content. So in Canada, where I was living at the time, they brought in a rule that they had to have 10 or 15% Canadian music, Canadian content, Canadian rock bands, okay? Mm -hmm. And McLuhan said, that's ridiculous to think you could have Canadian content because many people were coming to Canada from all over the world. So somebody from India or from South America, Argentinians, they heard the music, whatever was on the Canadian radio, as Argentinians. They, put, they projected their own background into the content, into interpreting the content. So you couldn't control to have an isolated 10% Canadian content, no such thing. Mm. So that was one of his most practical applications of, of this second aphorism, the user is the content. So propaganda 
in, in the 1560s, he said George Orwell was a dope duffer. He um, described basically, you could say 1934 disguised as 1948, but um, uh, McLuhan said he was describing 1900. Mm -hmm. And another time he said 1934, but not the present. Mm -hmm. And so, because McLuhan said people uh, were just too lost in the ideas that they were brainwashed by the literary messages uh, or oral messages and missing the changes that's happened. Now just look at social media. Social media has wrecked everything compared <laughs> to what people knew, right? In many levels, there's lots of services of social media, but there's a lot of disservices. And Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Paul Allen, and these other guys had no clue what they were gonna do to their society as a medium massaging everybody and previous media, right? Mm -hmm. The previous media that actually McLuhan later said when he said the medium is the message the medium is what the society is already made up of and new technology comes in as a figure and alters the ground of what you've already established in your society whatever it's made up of it's not so many people in the 60s and he wrote like this said okay television uh, is the medium but he later said no in a figure ground sense which he got from guest cell therapy uh, TV is a figure and the ground is what is already here and you know when TV comes in uh, and you're not inclined to look at the formal effects but you start to notice things are changing in in your newspaper in in your your bulldozers or in the way people are acting in business the the social mood changes um, and that should be a clue that something is causing a change. Mm -hmm. So then if you're a McLuhanite, you say, oh, okay, this new medium TV is doing something on a very formal level to our century structures. So what happens in the 50s, you get Elvis, you get beehive hairdos, and you get uh, uh, the Cold War. You get all those paranoid uh, different levels of the older media reacting to the new media. Uh, you know, the whole McCarthyism in the States, thinking everybody was a communist, uh, but that's because the collectivity of the TV image, the beehive, was more claustrophobic for Americans than they were used to as literate individual billiard ball individuals, you know, fragmented individual rights, the Clint Eastwood archetype, um, or the John Wayne thing. That was starting to erode, especially among the kids. Mm -hmm. And so it looked like Communist ideas had gotten into the Washington bureaucracy or something, and were changing people on a on a brainwashing level. That's what McCarthy thought, but it was immature. He wasn't. And McLuhan wrote about it and criticized McCarthy in the early fifties about missing the real propaganda. So propaganda is form, and once you understand that, you're on your way to understanding McLuhan. And it's not that simple. But when he spoke in the when he got famous in the late sixties. He's in the mix of all this new flowering of, of psychedelic rock or sports and, and the whole media wealth that started to happen. The instant replay came in. So how could one guy, a philosopher, have any influence on anybody or even be understood? Mm -hmm. So, and he would comment on that. And basically the image that everybody has of McLuhan was created by Madison Avenue. And he had to be filtered through that to even get his ideas out there. So he was always, occasionally, I remember, I dropped in his office in 71 and his brother, who was the front man, his personal assistant said, we're, we're withdrawing for a while. We're not doing any interviews. We're not going traveling anywhere. So we're staying in Toronto. I'm going to work locally. He had a sense of managing his image. He knew he'd gone out too far. Actually, everybody was over, was, um, you know, backlashing on his image in 69, 70, 71. So he retreated, but he didn't stop what he was doing or talking, but he just did it locally. Then in 1974, he started going out again and traveling around the world. So he was very cagey in understanding how to modulate his image. Yeah, I remember uh, there's, there's, there's a ton in there that I want to touch on, especially a little. But before I sort of jump back to a little, because I think there's some interesting connections there. Um, yeah. The, you know, the social media thing, I remember watching, listening, well, listening to a few interviews with, you know, Zuckerberg and the, the big figureheads of social media and all of them are saying yeah we our kids our kids don't have social media we're not letting our kids have social media <laughs> that's kids, which right. is like that's the only message you need right is yeah you know the the, the creator does not want their 
their lineage anywhere near that creation. But then, you know, there's a there's a real bleak one about a guy who was, you know, up, way up in Facebook and he he left because he said, look, the only thing that's going on behind the scenes there is the development of a casino. Right? They're just developing yeah. ways for you to to more efficiently get that dopamine kick. That's all that is now. And it's you know that whole idea of, you know, there's a there's a sort of common saying now if the software is free, if the service is free, you're the you're the you're the content, right? You're the uh, you're the one you're the who's content. you're the loss. You're yeah. the loss because you know, like you said with poetry, you read poetry, you bring your subjective experience to it, or if it's very high level poetry, you might it might be so well formed that there is an objective thing which everyone gets the same sense from it. Whereas social media, all you have is an empty form for you to fill, so you end up just mimetically you know in that Girardian sense mimetically just copying everyone else and then you develop basically sort of a, another social virus um but the alum- uh, let me just say, yeah, let me yeah. just say this as uh as thinking about the user's content which is a very uh casual easy idea to understand and many people understand and believe that okay project your own stuff why McLuhan he he said I had that other idea, the user content, but I never said it in the 50s, 60s because the important thing was the other idea that people didn't, the other half that people weren't aware of. So it's not that the user's content is revolutionary. It's just that he was criticized for ignoring content, and but he had a whole neat thing to say about it when he got around to doing it in the 70s. And he made a lot about the users of content and had some very interesting statements. Uh, about, uh, say, Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, how he used the media as his content, and they were his users, and he would play with it. But um, as you were saying, uh, I just thought I better say that, that Mm -hmm. the users of content is what everybody, illiterate people think. Yes, we put our own experience into it. So the revolutionary part of it was the medium is the message, is the message. So back to what you were saying. Uh, Oh, I wanted to say, did you, Social Dilemma, did you look at the movie Social Dilemma? See, now, I've heard about this, but I'm skeptical of anything that's put on Netflix because that form immediately, like, whenever yeah. everyone's talking about something, I'm just already, I'm immediately skeptical. I know that sounds really pretentious, but, like, when I heard about the Social Dilemma, you know, this 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 social critique of technology, I was thinking, yeah, a lull was going on about this in the 60s with the technological society, and this was then... Uh, absolutely misinterpreted by Ted Kaczynski um, with uh, Industrial Society in its future. And I mean, the whole anarcho-primitivist thing, John Zerzan, everyone's been, you know, the technological critique's been there far longer. And McLuhan's the one who's going right back and saying, it doesn't start with TV. It starts in the 1900s. It starts yeah. with the Industrial Revolution, right? Yeah. The thing about Social Dilemma is mm-hmm. they interview people like you were quoting mm-hmm. from Facebook employees yeah. and they were quite high up so they had a lot of interesting inside uh, experiences to report and it's it's uh, well done up to a point but it's very popular um, in the sense that communities watch it uh, parents and teachers make sure their kids in school see it uh, it struck a chord because people were ready to start to look at media differently because it was it disgusting them so much yeah I mean as helpful as it is, it's sort of like uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to grasp for a metaphor, but it's like a uh, I don't know like a, a leaflet for quitting alcohol in an off license, right? It's like well, yeah. as it's as, not- as nice as it is that Netflix Netflix has promoted it, we still have to we still have to open the drawbridge and go into this absolute casino of stimulation to even you know get it. So really, maybe what we what the real need was like a pamphlet, you know, something that's absolutely going to knock you out of your stasis instead of like, oh, look, look how bad media is while I'm watching media, right? It's it's a bit of a difficult one, but that's the easiest way to get it across. Yeah, and McClellan did produce these pamphlets. He called them broadsides, mm-hmm. and he had very shocking statements in them, you know, one pager, and he would uh, distribute those. Mm-hmm. But the people, um, it's easy... For McLuhan said, a point of view is irrelevant dealing with the dynamics of a new environment. Mm. Most people are proud of their point of view. They educate their point of view. They change it. They develop it. And to be told it's not relevant, they don't know what to do with themselves. Mm. So McLuhan would say, take Finnegan's Wake. That's the book I'm translating. 
And they'll say, well, you can't read it. It's 60 languages of pages. Yeah, well, you start looking at it at the book differently. You don't read it as a book. You recognize it's a book made it with a shortwave radio situation. It's a radio program. You, it just, uh, you have to see what radio does uh, as opposed to books and then see that's why it looks different. It doesn't look like a book because it's other media. So he had ways to uh, break people's perceptions and that was the, the key one. He took the worst book in history, but it's actually a, a genius book mm -hmm. once you know how to read it. And it's like, what could, it's like um, Wild Man Fisher, you know that guy that Zappa promoted? No. Okay, let me just think of the most retarded musician ever. And, and I go around telling you, well, the key to this uh, revolution I want you to join is based on this retarded guy. There was a bunch of girls called the Smiths. You know that band? Yeah. The little, remember the Smiths? Yeah, the boss the Smiths. made to be ridiculous. It's like me raving about the Smiths as a revolutionary program. That's how stupid it appeared for McClellan to talk about finning his wake. Mm -hmm. Nobody understood, even thought it was a worthwhile book to read. All the big uh, literary giants said it was a bunch of nonsense. Even Kurt Vonnegut said that. So that's what was ironic about McClellan. He picked what appeared to be stupid and said, this is the key for us to get smarter. Well, you need to. I mean, surely that's his point, though. You can't pick any, you can't, much like the social dilemma being on Netflix, as helpful as that is, you can't pick anything that's in the system already because it's been tampered with, right? It's like we meant, last time we mentioned um, Deleuze and Guattari, and they, they, they come up with that point, right? Yeah. If, if the cogs have already been turning and you come along, you're you're in the we're always in the middle of a machine there's no beginning it's always middles and that's the problem so that's finnegan's wake i guess is his is McLuhan's way of stepping right out and not even you know and looking at the whole thing and saying you need to look at the form stop looking at each individual beginning or middle or that's all content you know you're getting wrapped yeah. up but the same thing applies right to the say, sorry what'd you say what's your last i was gonna say there? same thing applies to the political spectrum i think is you no one ever thinks you know, whenever it's like addresses the question of the spectrum itself, right? The spectrum yeah. is just a containment facility. Oh yeah, I'm left, I'm right. But I, I'm left, I'm right, I'm center. You're still on the same thing. Yeah, but that spectrum is a a, 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 a method for journalists to get their copy done quickly every day. They need quick categorizations. And so I blame the journalists for keeping the left, right bullshit going, you know, those categories. Yeah. But the, in Finnegan's Wake, you're always in the middle in the book you're always in the middle if there is a middle uh, but you're not you're not at the end or the beginning you don't get to an end or a beginning well, there's no such thing there's no such thing as you know the cogs have always been turning so you have yeah. to you have to scramble but back to uh, alul that's super interesting i mean i did um two episodes recently on alul and we had to do two because people don't realize that with alul probably much like McLuhan, and this is the point i'm going to try to draw out here is that McLuhan has, everyone knows him, uh, sorry, Alul, everyone knows him for technological society and propaganda. Those are the two books. So everyone sort of pigeonholes him into that. And actually, the scholar I was talking to was saying, people don't get it. The religious side is completely ignored. And Alul explicitly said, you need both, otherwise you're not getting my work. You know, you're not understanding the full picture. Because the pessimistic thing I'm pointing out with the technological side, the only way you can, like, deal with that, overcome that, or even, you know, heal yourself from it is the other side do you think the same applies for McLuhan uh, McLuhan believed that he if you were a co-writer like Barrington Nevitt was a really good co-writer in the 70s his final co-writer um, Barry I became a good friend of Barry and he told me every now and then they, they'd spent they met in 64 so they've been together like 10 years day in and day out doing McLuhan's work and McLuhan and Barry helped me write this great book called Take Today. Um, uh, Barry told me that every night in Marshall said, he'd say, Barry, why aren't you a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> and Barry was a Marxist. He was a lefty from the 30s. He was never going to get into religion. But he uh, he had his own mystical view of things. Um, but he, uh, he, uh, he said, McLuhan, favored talking to Catholics, um, nuns and stuff. Uh, he um, he was a Catholic uh, convert, but he thought the Vatican and the Pope were all doing, were doing it all wrong. So he was actually a revolutionary in the medium. And if you put his uh, other main system assistant in the 70s, George Thompson, told me that you put McLuhan up against a thousand Catholics, he's not like any of them. He's different. As a matter of fact, George said, Marshall wasn't really a Catholic. He was something else. Well, you call it a mystic or a 
a prophet or something, but he was an active person in his career, in his religious life. And he went to mass every day. Every day he went to mass. Uh, he needed he needed it to probably you know, get centered because he was in the maelstrom and every technology that came along since the 40s, he got sick. He got sick as a result of uh, each medium. I figured out that pattern uh, in retrospect. But uh, well, like so, physically sick? Yeah, yeah. He had, pro he had bad gallbladder from 46 to 51 when he was doing... Uh, uh, mechanic bride in the late 60s he he had the longest brain surgery in history yeah, he, 22 correct me if i'm wrong didn't he suffer from like mic micro seizures or micro sort of uh, he had, fits or something? Uh, well, he, had, he in the classroom in the 60s he'd be talking to his kids the kids in the school and uh all of a sudden he'd he'd uh, put his hand up like a nazi salute or dr strange love and stop talking and just stare into space. <laughs> and then after a minute or so, and the kids would be scared, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> and all of a sudden he would put his head down and pick up where he left off. <laughs> so wow. then a year, a couple of years later, they found a, a tumor and they did this long brain surgery and it was a benign tumor, so he survived it, but it made him more sensitive on hearing and his senses were odd. He also lost the last two years of reading before the environment. But then with Ion, I can talk to him through a medium, okay? Now, you don't have to believe this, but I'll just tell you this point. He, uh, a guy named Doug Copeland, wrote a book on McLuhan a few years ago. He wrote, he he did, wrote Generation X, right? Yeah. 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 And he, so he was asked to do a book on McLuhan, mm -hmm. and he makes a big deal out of uh, this medical problem. And he thought McLuhan was autistic and, and other stupid stuff. McLuhan was told me he was totally pissed off with that book because he claimed that he did that on purpose as a put on to get the students attention to shock him to wake him up and start listening. So it was a skit. He did it as a, as a teacher. Now, if you don't know McLuhan, that sounds ridiculous. But if you know McLuhan, he was a prankster. He was an artist. He said in the 40s, he was going to infiltrate decent society, decent in quotes. And that meant get a PhD and have an audience every day in the classroom mm. because the arts uh, after World War II were more commercialized. Look what happened to uh, Jack Kerouac. I mean, he became famous for a beatnik thing and he hated being the beatnik. Mm. You, he got screwed by Madison Avenue, just like McLuhan did on one level, but McLuhan knew, understood the process was more detached, but he knew, and he told Hugh Kenner, the famous uh, critic who was a student, get a PhD. Back then in the forties, that wasn't a big deal. And he says, your audience is always going to be in the schools. Mm. So that's where you do your art or that's where you work on people. What did Allen Ginsberg do? He ran around the 50s, you know, uh, stripping or uh, smoking up or having a protest or something. But he was always on the hustle uh, to get an audience mm. out in the world. And uh, that wore him out. McLuhan had a guaranteed audience that he could fuck with. And he meant it. He said, I'm going to make these kids have a shocking, like meeting Antonin Artaud or, or Duchamp. They, they're not going to meet a, a person like that. So McLuhan did it for them. He made himself interesting to them. I think that's a good, that's a good comparison, McLuhan and Duchamp. I, yeah. I adore Duchamp. Um, and well, Duchamp is referred in the cover of A Mechanical Bride. That refers to the, uh, the 1914 Bride painting. Is that the one no, where you have it? to go up to the door and you you have to look no. for? It? Because Duchamp, that, that, that's a tant donne given a tant donne. Yeah, because that French. was that was Duchamp's kind of McLuhan esque comment on media, right? He understood that all paintings are just going to be digitalized. You can view them wherever you want. So he made this painting behind a wooden door, drilled a very very small hole through it. So you have to go, and all the pictures of it are super obscure because they just can't they can't get it. Right, and he also was showing that museum life was based on the eye mm -hmm. and uh, he read McLuhan he learned about McLuhan from John Cage you know his chess mm -hmm. buddy and uh, so you know you're going to make a visual artifact you know really emphasize it because you <laughs> you're going to be you have to use your eye and it really stands out but mechanical bride um what is it uh the there's the um bride and the bachelors that was the plate glass that you could see. That was see his through. last major work. He worked on that for like third, like years, I think. 
No, no, the attempt on a 46 to 66 is, is his last work and no one knew it. But on the public level, yes, the large glass was his last level. And he did that in the 20s. But um, so uh, whatever the I forget the name of the the bride painting of a uh, bride coming down a staircase. And uh, that's yeah. that's what the mechanical bride that, that McClellan was referring to. And he mentions Duchamp. And later he wrote a very interesting short essay on Duchamp, very advanced uh interpretation of, of Duchamp. He said, he said Duchamp uh, anticipated computer design, the rippling of a computer screen. So that's pretty neat that people would think of, that he thought of that. No one else was saying that. And that was back in the 60s. I mean, I could talk about Duchamp all day because my uh, my bachelor's was in was in art and my final piece was like stacks of, you, you, know, you know, spam? Yeah, yeah, it was stacks of that with poster just ridiculing art on it. So that was my farewell well, I to met, the art world. <laughs> I knew Duchamp. Did I it? met him when I was, I was a kid in France, growing up I in think France. My, my, I'm not very good with like linear history because it seems obscure. Because he seems no offense to yourself, he seems so long ago now, right? Like, yeah. so how old was he when you when you how old were you when you met him and how old I was, was about, um, I was uh, 1953. Uh, I was 1930. 31. I'd heard about my father. I grew up in Paris, France. Uh, do you so, mind if I ask, how old are you now? In 98? No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> I am. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you're not. That's a lie. I can't believe it. That... No, there's a long story. I, it's well known that I'm uh, not, that the people think he's not, but I'll tell them how I did. Uh, I got this a thing that stopped my wife and my aging in 69 called the D cell from Joe Dunn Sloan in Los Angeles. There's a whole story I'll tell you. I can tell you, yeah. I'm not going to wait. No. And, uh, and then our, with Ion, we got new products, which slowed our aging down even more. I will not die. I can confidently tell you, I will not die. So what, where did you meet Duchamp? This is exciting. Well, I, my father, I met James Joyce, um, DSL, everybody in Paris in the 30s when I was 14, 15, and 16. I even met Gurji through my father, who was into all this avant-garde stuff. Right. And he used to talk to me about Duchamp. Uh -huh. But I didn't meet him until I went to New York in 53. And uh, I was told to look him up. My father had the contact. And so you'll see in my diaries, my interaction with Duchamp, um, that's when I met him in New York City in 53. And, you and then I, came, and you I had a chance. You met what? you met Gajif as well. I met that yeah when I was a teenager. I, the problem was I didn't know who these people were, but in my diaries, every time I met a giant like Elliot Pound or Joyce or Gurdjieff, I'd have a psychic flash. Mm -hmm. So in my diaries, I show you what image triggered by them, okay. which was all subjective, you know. And I I don't know why those images happen, but they're interesting. Uh, but I had no intellectual understanding of what I was interacting with, you know. Okay, so what's the, too young. I sort of feel I have to delve in, right? What's the D-cell? Yeah. Uh, in 19, late 40s, a doctor, no, a pharmacist in Vermont, in America, the state mm -hmm. Vermont, uh, he got into organic gardening, mm -hmm. and he made a mixture from barley uh, and put it in the garden and it kind of worked. So then he would make the mixture into a cube, a stone, and he would put the stone in water. Mm -hmm. This this energized stone that he would make out of a mixture of stuff, seeds and grains. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd look under his uh, microscope and he'd see a, a, a light mm -hmm. in the molecules. Mm -hmm. So when it got to that stage, he'd take that liquid and make uh, ice cube, well, cement cubes out of the water mm -hmm. he put it in water and the bottom half of the jar would remain constant you wouldn't use it you use the top half and then fill it up uh like you. it yeah and uh he um i started giving it to his clients mm -hmm. and the air would come back they'd get healthy and he how really I, had great how do i get some yeah you want to well yeah. you want to get our but but here's the thing uh you, within you, a couple you do stuff now yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, okay, yeah we okay. do. We, we okay. moved on it. Yeah. So the so in the in the early fifties, the what would we call today the FDA, the authorities heard about 
this thing, this guy stirring up trouble in, in Vermont doing unauthorized healings and wasn't a doctor. So they harassed him and put him out of business. So he moved to California and he started doing it with farmers and, and orange orchards. Mm. But meanwhile, another guy uh, in Rhode Island got the formula from Mr. Brown. Right. His name was Brown. Uh, forget the second guy's um, uh, name. Uh, and he then met the third guy in Los Angeles in the, er, what? Oh yeah, Mr. Dory was the second guy, mm. D-O-R-E-Y. And then Joe Dunn Sloan, an, an eccentric man in, in uh, Los Angeles, met Dory, got the formula, and we got the desal from him in the late 60s. Okay. And so we would put it in our water and the water be all sparkly and be pure and mm. probably energizing us. And our aging slowed down or even stopped. Wow. And uh, and people notice this through the years. Uh, my wife right behind me, my bride, she's still a bride. Uh, and this is after 53 years. Uh, she's behind me. She looks like she's uh, 25. So the thing is, is that when we contacted Ion, uh, we wondered if I, uh, oh, Joe had given Carolyn the formula because he was a well-known doctor. And he respected her in 91. He died in 93. Okay. So he gives Carol the formula. Yeah. And, uh, but we tried to make it. It didn't work. So then we're talking to Ion in 2009 and 10. And they told us, make a bigger block, a 400-pound block, and, uh, and how to do it. So we did it. And it worked. So we took the, uh, the barley mash that you use to make the liquid. Mm. And we uh, squeezed that and made a substance called RNA drops because they affect the RNA mm -hmm. and chromosome 14, we found out from ion. Yeah. And that stops your aging, makes you eternally start taking that stuff. You can't die. It changes your genes. Now, granted, these are crazy statements I'm making, well, but we, I, I, doing... I interview druids, occultists, you know, I'm, I'm sincere <laughs> when I say, I'm, you know, I'm not taking the mic. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm open. I'm open. Okay, what's good. ion? What's ion? That's what I. Ion is, is uh, non-physical. Okay. It's the. Uh, if you, he originally told us in 2009 that he was the guff. Uh, what's the guff? You look it up in Wikipedia. It's a Jewish word for heaven, uh, where souls go when they die. They mm -hmm. go to heaven. That's called the guff. So at first I thought ion was a, a, a bunch of entities. Uh, plural but then within a couple of days he clarified no we're not we're not entities we are the environment that entities are in or souls are so mm -hmm. it's actually ion is heaven and they fulfilled the biblical prophecy and other religions prophecy that heaven and earth will merge at some point and we have a new world that's what's happened here ion is merged with physical and he's altered physical He's given us a free energy device, a device that makes endless electricity. And we also have all these incredible products which have revolutionary effects to everybody. We saved Donald Trump from fucking COVID last October. That's a whole story. Trump uses our products. The queen uses it. The Pope uses it. Putin uses them. Intelligence agencies use them. And Saudi princes use them because they're smart. Can, and I, they can, got I, can I buy some? Notice. What? Are they for sale? Yeah, yeah, you can get all the stuff. We now have 10 products. The drops were the first, RNA drops. Could so you, I'll give do you, you ship to the UK? Yeah, actually, we have a distributor in UK, so you, you'll get it. Do you want to sponsor the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't do that. Okay. We we, uh, we don't get commercially involved with people. We just oh, okay. put our stuff. So it's like, it's like a, for seekers only. Right. I mean... Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe if you met the woman who, who distributes in England, maybe she'd make a deal with you or something, you know, or sponsor you, okay. you know? Well, yeah. I, I would, I would, I just intrigued. I'll, I'll, I'll order some first, right? Yeah. I'll send you the, uh, the link and all. Okay. So, but you also. Well, let me just say for anybody who's listening, RNA, like DNA, but it's RNA reset. So you're resetting your RNA. RNA reset.com. That's all. Okay. RNA reset. reset. Okay, but let's uh, go back to Carol McLuhan. Now, here's an interesting thing. You, about you said you were you said you were uh, communing with McLuhan. Oh, I speak to him through a medium. I did a, a previous medium called uh, the Evergreens. Michael Blake Reed channeled the Evergreens, six and a half, seven thousand entities from 
1974 to 2004, mm -hmm. 30 years. And he was a tremendous medium. Uh, he was in um, 19 countries. You know, he had clients in that 19 countries, including the State Department of the government, of the American government. And he had 11,000 sessions. Yeah. But I tried to make the D sell through him, and it didn't work. Um, I don't know what else to say about him, but that was before Ion. Ion came after. I, I accidentally uh, evoked Ion. I didn't evoke the Evergreens. That was done by someone How did you else. accidentally evoke something? Um, the guy that, uh, quote, channels Ion uh -huh. in, in the... Before we do Ion, can I tell you a McLuhan thing? Yeah. yeah, that yeah. Relates to it. So McLuhan was interested in... Uh, uh, alternative consciousness and all that stuff. I once told him that I was sort of eating a lot of bananas, uh, living on a banana diet. And he said, that's not good, Bob. Edgar Casey says, that's that's that's, that's not good. He quoted Edgar Casey for God's sake. <laughs> 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 and this is a Catholic. And no one had ever heard that. I mean, he, he knew I was doing medium. So he, he actually went to the Evergreens himself. Or his family did on his behalf, and I I heard the a lot of the contents of the session from his daughter, uh, Mary McLuhan. Anyways, McLuhan was interested in this stuff, so he found out we had the D cell in uh, uh, September 1979. So he asked Carolyn to come over to his place, and she came over and explained the D cell. And then a week later, maybe just five days later, he had a stroke, September 26, 79. And he never really recovered from that. And he died about a year later. But the point was when, when uh, the handyman who we were good friends with, Jim Stewart, went into McLuhan's house on the morning of Saturday after he had collapsed on Friday, there was the D cell sitting on a little vestibule nightstand kind of thing. Uh, there it was unopened. So he had failed to take the, to put the D cell in the water and start drinking it. And it turned out, you could say fatal. He, he was gone a week later. He didn't, he didn't get to mow, he didn't get the promised land. But he, it, it, the D cell was sitting there in his, in his hallway, unopened. Damn, that's like seconds away, seconds away yeah, from, yeah, yeah. wow. So that's, I wanted to finish that, back to Ion. So I met, uh, Carolyn met uh, um, this billionaire in Atlanta, Georgia in 2005. Uh, I wasn't there. Um, he calls up in early uh, January, February 2006 and says, you quoted your husband. It's been sticking my mind. I want to ask him what his quote meant. It was probably some McLuhan S thing or something. So I got talking to him and we became phone buddies. And there's a lot that happened, but uh, we became friends. We visited him in 2007, and in October 2008, he uh, we had just moved here, and he called us up and said, "I've got to write something. I got all these ideas in my head." Now he's a businessman; he doesn't know he doesn't know anything about writing or, or ideas. But also, he's got all this stuff happening. So Carolyn said, "Well, I'll uh, just dictate it to me, and I'll type it." So we started doing that. Then uh, a few months later, he uh, he started being transported to other worlds. Mm -hmm. These were not attempts by him. It just happened. Mm -hmm. He'd go up on his patio in his mansion and suddenly be in another world. Mm -hmm. So he was the kind of person who would never tell anybody this was going on, mm -hmm. but he knew about the evergreens and my interest in medium. So he felt okay to tell us, but he thought we might think he was crazy mm -hmm. and lose our friendship, but we didn't. And I, I listened to him. So the second phase was being transported. Then in early, say February, 2009, few months later, all of a sudden his house is filled with ghosts, with people, dead people who talk to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, this went on for a few weeks. And then one day uh, a ghost came to him and said, uh, say hi to Bob. Mm -hmm. And he was shocked at that. He said, well, who are you? I'm Dr. Peter Beter. And he explained who he was. So JW calls me up and says, do you know a Peter Beter? I said, yeah, he died in 1987 in the middle of a gold deal with the Queen with Queen um, Queen Elizabeth, the Buckingham Palace that we were doing. I mean, there's good evidence he was murdered. But the, um, the thing was that uh, he had died in 87. And this is 22 years later, he is showing up to JW mm -hmm. and saying, say hi to Bob. So when... 
when JW told me about this, and I told him I knew Dr. Beter, um, I thought I used to talk to Dr. Beter through Michael Blake Reed and the Evergreens. So I said, you know, these ghosts, 150 ghosts, your home might be the Evergreens gathering around you because the medium stopped doing channeling them in 2004 mm -hmm. after 30 years. And I was a good friend of that situation. So I said, I'd like to talk to these ghosts or maybe even Dr. Beter. So the next day, we get him on the phone, speaker phone, and Carolyn's there with a notepad, and I'm just sitting there. And I said, I don't know uh, what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so let's just be quiet. Let's just be quiet and see what happens. Uh, and, and within 30 seconds, um, Jeb's uh, voice started talking. And he was saying odd things. I don't know what he was saying. Um, but Carolyn was writing it down. And this went on and it became a little more interesting. When I got a chance to review it later, more consciously and more relaxed, he was talking about the Resolute Desk in the White House, the special desk in the White House. And he was talking also about our conversations the night before around Dr. Beter, when I was getting the idea to talk to these ghosts. So after about 20 minutes, I said, this is pretty good. With the evergreens, I could talk to dead people. Let's see if I can do it with this situation. So I, what you would do with the evergreens, you'd say, or his, the guy's wife would say, we would like to locate somebody. And you'd give their date of death, birth, or where they live, their address. So I started to say, I, uh, I'd like to locate. And before I could say Marsh McLuhan, the voice said something very personal about his daughter that only I knew. Mm -hmm. Okay. This very personal thing, the voice, it's just an uh, anonymous voice. So I said, holy shit, this, this, is, this could be McLuhan. So then I interrogated McLuhan with his ideas, and he was pretty good at echoing what I knew one should say if you were McLuhan about certain things, you know. Um, but I knew obscure stuff, so I could ask extra McLuhan stuff. So after 20, 15 minutes of talking to McLuhan, uh, I said, wow, this is pretty neat, but I want to do some other stuff. So we go on for an hour and a half. Then, then the boy says, we need to uh, get JW out of his altered state. So we're gonna remove ourselves. So JW wakes up or gets out of his altered state. I can't say he was asleep. And uh, he says, wow, let's do that again. And I said, why? He says, it felt like a constant orgasm. <laughs> wow. And so two days later, he was ready to do it again. And because okay. he was a billionaire, there was no money problem. He had lots of time. He didn't have a job. Uh, so uh, with the Evergreens, it was 500 bucks for an hour. Mm -hmm. So it always cost him. Here it was, had access to something that would talk for seven hours, not in one hour limit like the Evergreens. And so we started the next, and two days later, What's on he, March 20th. He had a seven and, hour orgasm? Uh, well, that we did about two hours okay. on the second day, but He's this time we recorded, it. we recorded the mm -hmm. second one. Yeah. And then the third one was on Sunday. It was March 18th, then March 20th, Carol's birthday, and then March 22nd. And I talked to James Joyce for an hour and 45 minutes about how to, how he wrote Phoenix Wake, which is incredible. And you can hear these things are online. Uh, they're pretty interesting. So that was two hours. So uh, JW was doing two hours, but then on March 25th, I got talking to Dr. Beter. He came through and explained uh, what was going on. And, uh, and JW went for six hours. Hmm. And that was incredible. And it ne then it never stopped. And here we are, what was that uh, 12 years later, hmm. we've recorded. And Ion always says, you got to record me or I won't talk. So we've recorded everything. We're now up to 31,000 hours. Where is all this? It's on a website called ionandbob.com. Just go to there and it's all there. Thousands of hours. Wow. So when was the last time you spoke to McLuhan? Uh, two or three years ago. Oh. Um, I talked to all kinds of other people and um, I've talked to so many people that I don't do that anymore because we are directly involved with the deepest parts of uh, the war that's going on now. And, in between different intelligence agencies we're in the middle of it because we have the new energy device and they know it the decent and they want 
No, the the battery, the box that makes endless electricity. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. and our and our new application of D cell, we call it the I cell. Okay. And it has the little eye, like an iPhone, the little eye. Yeah. And yeah. when you spell ion, you use a little eye. I and a capital O N. So, anyways, the I cell is our, our magic ingredient. What's uh what's the war? What's at stake and what's who are the sides? Oh, everybody. I mean, it, it's totally McLuhan S. It's a global theater, which is merged into the Android meme. And I I could talk about this another time. And then that became the tech body. Everything you see in the media on the news or any information is run by the tech body. It it is a uh, hell, hell um on uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, 1968. Yeah. Remember the computer on the spaceship, um, the yeah. rocket comes alive, yeah. tries to take over? Well, technology came alive like that, way beyond what people uh, imagine. They might think it's happening in the future. They don't believe it's happened now. Now, what was good about the Social Dilemma movie, the one media expert they had on there, he said, look, the technology's reached this point it's a living organism. And he described it much like I'm describing the tech body. And so I thought that guy's pretty aware. He, he understands it's a lot further along than people realize. So our technology has evolved in the tech body. And the tech body is at war with us. And there's a lot of metaphysics. I won't go into that. But everybody is in a weakened state now. Nobody has uh, anything going for them as good as what we have. We have the best medicine. We have the best energy uh, devices. So oil consciousness, big pharma, they're all weak compared to us. And they're fighting over our technology as that, well as fighting among themselves. Is that because they're all working on the empirical level, right? They're not working yeah. on a... That's right. So this is almost the, like a... Here's a statement I'll make about that. Uh, I've decided, after working all these years with IOM, that the, the science of the 21st century means you have to work with non-physical. Yeah. And we've got a world monopoly in that. We're the only ones doing it. Mm -hmm. There are other channelers, but they're not as good as ours. And uh, so that's the new science. You work with uh, with uh, the uh, non-physical, whatever. And McLuhan predicted that. He said, mysticism is tomorrow's science. Dream today. And that's okay. what we're doing. Okay, let me sort of run something by you and see if I'm sort of on the right track in re with regards to this war, right? I'll probably come at it from a Kantian framework. So outside of our immediate representational phenomenal consciousness, time, everything, time and space isn't isn't as we see it, right? Right. This uh, tech body, which I and other people have probably written along these same lines, have sculpted as capitalism. Is that something in the noumenal future, which is trying to bring itself about? from the future right it's trying to bring itself about as a sort of singularity and the war for you is to try retrieve the uh retrieve the awakened consciousness of humanity from that eventual future so what you've just said is what an advanced uh, thinker informed person like yourself would come up with ion goes a lot further than that okay. you're going to have these ideas shaken up First off, there's no time. And Ian says, if you start saying you're a time travel, that's bullshit because there's no time. There's no so linear, you don't. Yeah, linear, linear time is bull. Right. Right. Or any kind of time. And then uh, he'll say, if you um, claim to be timeless, that's bullshit because even though it's less time, time less, it's still involved with time. You've got to get completely erase any notions of what time is to be, begin to see what is. Mm -hmm. But um, Ion develops all these points. Basically, uh, Ion has come forth to explain our eternity that we all have. I mean, there's no death and you don't disappear after you die. Um, but he applies eternity to physics, to sociology, to technology. You, you you know if some if the pope promises eternal life in in, uh, in some place where after you die they don't take the principle of eternity and eternal universe to science they don't apply it to this world that's what Ian does so we have the first time a voice that never stops talking we have endless energy with uh, with Ion we'll talk to anybody about anything but the main principle he's explaining to us how eternity is part of everything in our knowledge and if we want to like cern ion explains what cern discovered and what they didn't discover 
And basically CERN shut down because they just started to discover some really radical things and their funders objected to that because being materialistic 3D people, it violated their sense of what was going on. As a matter of fact, it probably would obsolesce the CERN machine. So you get limitations like that by people, but we don't have limitations ourselves. So we take on the new stuff. What's, what's the teleology here? What's the, the end goal for ION? Uh, well, he says right now, we're in the tribulations. Now we know there's many biblical fundamentals and predicted uh, end times and all that for the last 50 years. Well, Ian says it's not the end times, it's the end of time. Mm -hmm. Literally, we're going into a world and we have that in social media. Everything is there, any level you want of, of data from the past, not the future, so to speak, but who knows, maybe someone's putting future stuff in there. The timelessness or the endless access to information puts you in a state of uh, eternity. So we've gotten it by our technology. So you, you can apply McLuhan, the technology got there first, and now we're going to catch up. So Ian talks about how we will, uh, we're in a pretty bad situation. He says the Black Plague that just came out of India and uh, came out of Africa, went to India and Brazil, killing all kinds of people, now moved to Minnesota and uh, uh, another state in, in America. And it's going to kill two thirds of the planet. Mm -hmm. This is what I said. Two thirds are going to die over the next couple of years. One third um, will be left, which is exactly the prediction of the book of the subgenius, <laughs> which is a whole other story. Uh, the church of the subgenius. But the so the point is, you either uh, die or ascend. And you need to take our products. And this is not a sales pitch. We don't fucking need money. We don't need you to buy this. But we tell you, you can't survive without our product. And not many people know that. But the people who do have our products, they feel so great. They feel eternal. So our products protect you from this virus. Nothing else will. It's actually a bacterial agent, not a virus, the new one. So very bad time happening right now. And Ian says, this is great because everything's going to collapse and we, society, will demand our energy device and our medicine because they'll be panicking. It's the only way we can bring in new technology because the old company's never going to let you have the new stuff. Big farmers not going to let you. They're too powerful, but they're all weakened now. And we are waiting in the wings to present it. And, and people like Donald Trump and the Pope and the Queen know this. So you sort of, I, mean, I imagine you've read William Burroughs, but it's sort of like William Burroughs language virus but it's a a metaphysical virus which is quite literally slowly disintegrating our time into smaller and more smaller and smaller increments until we just transcendentally just dissipate yeah that's a very good statement what you made and and burroughs i met burroughs i knew burroughs he he had a very interesting relationship with McLuhan that people don't know about oh yeah well it makes they, sense uh, it makes sense there's a lot of overlap yeah. there yeah, okay. and, and McLuhan didn't like the social milieu of Burroughs, you know, down there in New York in the bunker. Uh, that was too painful for him as a Catholic person and maybe as a Canadian. But uh, uh, but intellectually, he, he I'll send you the link to a fantastic review he made of Burroughs' books in 64 for Nation magazine, mm -hmm. American magazine. Which book? I mean, I guess he's he did, largely talking about Naked did, Lunch and... Yeah, Naked Lunch and uh, Nova Ticket to Express. What, what's yeah, the other and one? Then Cities of the Red Knight. Uh... No, that's years later. But that that was on that was on McLuhan's uh, desk the week he died. I mean, the week he had. I saw it on his desk. He was reading it. Cities of the Red Knight. Yeah, it that's was one like of my favorite bars. Look up the date. It should be. It came out in seventy eight or seventy nine because it was in seventy nine when uh, he collapsed and that was on his table. Okay. But so he kept up with everybody. Uh, remember, he 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 inspired Tim Leary to come up with turn on, tune in, drop out. Mm -hmm. So he he was a virus going into all these subcultures and influencing them. But he was never a victim or a dupe of that particular subculture. He remained detached. Okay. So so he used his Catholicism as a cover or or excuse for his detachment. Okay. Okay. Because he certainly didn't act like a Catholic. You no, know? no, not at all. <laughs> okay, so there, I mean, obviously what we've discussed there with Ion and this sort of strange time war, which uh, I'll send you some stuff which you might not have come across before. If people are also talking about time war in the 90s. They, maybe you've come across them, but they're quite... Oh, yeah, the war. 
So the war is um, different elites. Uh, basically, I say that what came out of uh, World War II is the first uh, intelligence was the uh, Catholic Church mm -hmm. around a guy named Turn and Taxes, T H U R N U N D T A X I S, uh, a German guy who created the first post postal system in the 1400s. So that's where you, you know, you had a, a communication system that the elites used. Um, so Turn and Taxes, famous family in Europe, they own, they did own 10 castles. But, but um, so you have the Catholic intelligence agency. Then the British get going with Queen Elizabeth I, and they create the uh, Royal Society and the Freemasons. So then the Catholic Church has to create the Jesuits to fight the, the British. Mm -hmm. So you have those two agencies for a couple hundred years. Then with the, and I bring McLuhan into this, when the telegraph came in, that created the emotion of multitude and a global village mood uh, in the working man. Mm -hmm. So the, the socialists and Marx and Engels and the communists, they hijacked that feeling and made a, a uh, revolution of creating unions. All right. So they get a base in Russia uh, and they build a nest egg. The Jesuits have a nest egg, a lot of money. The British have a lot of money. The British have the edge over the Catholic Church when they move into North America. Uh, and uh, the British Empire gets going by the 1800s. But then the telegraph sc screws that up and makes a new dimension. So then the Russians come in. So then you have the Bolshevik intelligence system and nest egg. And then with radio, a new medium creates another kind of phenomenon. And the Nazis surface or the fascists, and they create a nest egg. So you've got a, you got a uh, Freemason uh, nest egg, Jesuit nest egg, Bolshevik, Nazis, and then after World War II, the Mossad. Because uh, America needed that place, a little wedge into the Middle East, you know, they put a lot of money and wealth into the uh, uh, Jewish state and the Mossad was able to build up an agency that was in between them all. So you go, let's say you come into the 50s and 60s with five agencies, but it's a shrunken global village, a global theater, and they all have to work together and they all know each other. Mm -hmm. And then when you get the decentralized cable TV and then the internet, that scatters the monopoly, of whatever intelligence uh, information the agencies had. And so you've had chaos among those five factions since then. That's why when you, you take a, an incident like 911, you'll get people saying, Russia did it, or the Soviet Union. You get another bunch of researchers say, no, the Mossad did it. Uh, some will say the Vatican did it. You'll, you'll find that all five are, there's always uh, someone out there who thinks it's one of those fives, okay? But what I came up with, and I went on the radio with this in the 80s, I, I was Alex Jones before Alex Jones, and I laid out the interplay of the five. And so I presented information from all of them, not one thing. I didn't have a point of view, you know, adapting McLuhan. So I created a very uh, unique radio show, and it's all on archives. You can listen to it all. Um, and then that gradually, it evolved naturally to Ion, mm -hmm. who tells me everything that uh, what I call the mystery landscape, we don't know, but elites knew or mystics or evolved people knew. It's never been said public what we say. So you can think we, uh, we sound like the occult or sound like uh, Gurdjieff or something, but no, Ion out talks all them. Ion talks for 12 hours uh, once a week, and we have a show on Tuesday, which goes for two hours. So Ion is endless information about all these details. We're, we're the new university is what I claim. And you, you've got 31,000 hours of data on there, plus new stuff. But we also have products that help people with their health. And we have a device, you know, whatever, you know, pre-Raphaelites or the data is or the Srilis. They never had a food uh, uh, you know, nutrition, they didn't have maybe a woman and Carolyn as an equal partner and Carolyn is equally involved in this and, and they didn't have an energy device. Nobody as a art movement or whatever we are, uh, pseudo secret society, nobody has what we are offering. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it for 10, 11 years. So that's how revolutionary we are. Something we were just saying, I wanted to add to, uh, oh yeah, Plato, mm -hmm. One of the books in uh, in Plato is called Ion, I-O-N. <clears throat> Not that well known, 
And what it is, Ion is what was called back then a rhapsode, mm -hmm. a, a poet that sort of went into a trance. Mm -hmm. And because literacy and the phonetic alphabet, to quote McLuhan, the phonetic alphabet's coming in, Greek society is going to be a different kind of written society. <clears throat> they, um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, and I don't know about Socrates, but uh, they were interested in lit writing poetry, not the channeled ranting Homer kind of bird stuff. So the debate in Plato is, is the writing, the new kind of writing poet, uh, more legitimate poetry because he reads other people mm -hmm. and he knows other poets. Whereas the old fashioned rhapsode typified by Ion uh, just rants their own stuff. It's hyper subjective, you know, they're just, in their own world and they can be entertaining or insightful but they they're oral and tactile as opposed to literate and visual so the debate is that ion loses okay ion loses uh, he's not a poet the new guys are the writing poets are the who's poets. against ion then who's the uh, socrates i guess it's socrates i mean allegorically speaking though is that like a Me no, the new the new writing poets. Oh, but like so, like mechanicality though. If we're yeah. speaking on that level, like the abstract, you know, abstract uh, automatons, te te well, technological sort of automatism. Well, no, the rhapsode would be uh, considered an automaton. Mm -hmm. Remember, Plato kicked the poets out of his establishment, out of his utopia. Mm -hmm. He was he was uh, that's the oral poets. He was into the literate writing poets. Mm -hmm. And so the writing poets, their image wins. Ion loses in that book, which is 2,500 years ago. Well, I see Ion back. In McLuhan terms, we have an oral tactile society. Mm -hmm. Rock is ranting. Rock is rhapsode poetry um, and uh, any other kinds of stuff that's been happening. Uh, the uh, rhapsode is back. And Ion is King Rhapsode, and uh, he's getting his vengeance on the writing. And Ion says that the, the Dark Ages didn't happen in what we call the Middle Ages. Uh, they happened with the printing press. Ion says that humans really got shut down by print. And McClellan writes about that. McClellan is not judgmental. He doesn't say print's bad, but he says we must recognize his disservices. So Ion knows a lot about the disservices, and says people before the printing press were quite almost like Julian Jane's bicameral mind, hallucinating and, and hyper subjective and, uh, and more intuitive in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So we, we naturally come back to that under electronic conditions and digital conditions. And um, so Ion's back, back in the saddle and Plato's looking for a job. <laughs> wow, this is big, this is big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, does that have connection to the, you know, the Plato Pythagoras and the, the the loose Egypt connections of when they were all going, you know, the bit that they they hint at but don't write about? Yeah, that's uh, I, that, that's what we learned from Ion, what they actually did, what Plato did with the, with, the, with the Egyptian influence. Yeah, what did they the do? The Temple of Ammon, I think it was the Temple of Ammon, A M M O N, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the major. Uh, we were just doing a lot on the Temple at Luxor. Uh, the other day, just on right up in my latest private session. Um, anyways, just I could go off on a lot of topics, but the point is that we get the actual history of like Pythagoras. I will tell us what he did, and we didn't know he did what he didn't do, what he got wrong. It's incredible. Every possible phenomenon you're interested in, I will give you uh, at least a view that you never heard before. You know, you can just say, well, that's interesting, and you don't know if it's true or not, but it's stimulating to have a new perspective, which is what Ein does on everything, completely new perspective. For example, take the, the myth of Atlantis. I asked uh, at the beginning, wh when it, where was Atlantis? Uh, where are they going to find it? Is it Bimini? Was Edgar Casey right? You know, these tr traditional questions. And Ein says, Atlantis hasn't happened yet. I go, What? He says, yeah, Atlantis in the timeless is a more perfect society, which we're moving towards. So it won't, it, it hasn't occurred yet. Now, who's ever said that before? And then he says the Giza pyramid will have a crystal on the top of it, which would be part of the new Atlantis. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see a different pyramid as our consciousness changes. Okay. 
So that's just that one topic, Atlantis. Yeah. So, it, so Ion is trying to, in the, in the sense of that Julian Jane's by camera mind, he is Ion trying to sort of draw us back towards that that state. No, the other. No, way. I, no, I, no. Ion says that they're source energy and therefore the ascended state, and the Earth originally was one continent, and it was an ascended continent. And the latest information is we came from the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. And when we quote fell, we fell into this dimension. And at first you had a, a, an ascended continent from the people in Andromeda galaxy who were quite cosmic or ascended, whatever you want to say. And as they fell and Ayn goes into the, the explanation of why we quote fell, the continents broke up into seven continents. Okay. But America, is the closest, most solid piece of the original continent. That, that's why America has this incredible landscape and abundance, you know, as a, as a terrain, the variety of America is fantastic. And it also has all the wealth of grains and all the stuff we grow. The specialness of, of America is because of, of its historical role from the original continent. And Ian says, now I don't know how this works, that all the kings in England, and I guess in France and Western Europe came from America. America was populated before Europe. <laughs> so it sounds like we're that, in, it sounds like we're in hell. What? It sounds like we're in hell. You fall to hell, uh, right? Well, yes. Well, Ein says the four horsemen ride forth every day for horsemen apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And yes, people are in hell, but you don't have to be. And you can be like Queen Victoria and say, not in my world. That's what she used to say, not in my world. <laughs> wow. So, so we, uh, we say that. Now, the, the royal family, they're, they're very, quote, occult-wise. And they parallel the world. And one of the greatest people in the 20th century was the Queen Mum. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what Ayn tells us about the Queen Mum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who I mean. Yep. And uh, uh, in World War II, mm -hmm. well, first of all, she's from Scotland. She was called a land girl, I think is what uh, Ayn said yeah, the, yeah. the classes would call. And uh, she figured out on the wall around Edinburgh how to go to other worlds. Yeah. So she was able to get documents in other worlds and present herself to the court in England, in London. Uh, you need to have documents to verify your royalty. She got them from another world. So she gets in there and then marries the king, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guy who wasn't supposed to be king, uh, Edward or whatever his name yeah, was, was yeah, supposed yeah. to be. So... So she's now queen or whatever they called her. Um, she's not queen, but she's queen mother. What, what was she? Uh, princess or something? I don't know what she was. Uh, it's in that movie, uh, something, The King's Speech. Okay. You ever see that? That's about that couple. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, in World War II, by 43, Britain is bankrupt. The allies, they rely on Britain. It's really bad. So the queen mom goes to another world and brings back all this gold. And so all the Western allies who were falling away because she didn't have, they didn't have any money in England anymore. Uh, they all got everybody back on board with this uh, new gold level. And uh, so the queen mom saved the fucking uh, Britain and the West. Okay, she caused this. Now, only people like Churchill and the elite knew this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then- How do you, you know this? Hmm? Ion, okay. And Ion knew all this. Yeah. And he's telling me all this. And um, what's interesting is that JW, being a socially fluid billionaire, was a friend of the queen. His family, which had come over with the pilgrims, knew the British royalty for a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. So that's why the queen was probably the first elite person to find out about us because JW met with her in 2010 as a friendly thing and he told her all about what he was going through with Ion and so she tuned into it but she was familiar with that stuff already in her family so um, I could go on but that's just an interesting point for you in that yeah. you apparently live in a place that thinks it's uh, a nation you know this is big, <laughs> this is big stuff man you, yeah. sh you should be where Alex Jones is. That's what I think. That's right. Have well, you, we have you are, met? Have you met? Have you met Alex Jones? Yes. yes. What, like, what What happened? I, I had Ion a show. Or... No, no, no. I, I I had a show uh, with another guy in Toronto in two thousand and 
too. And uh, so Alex was uh, known a bit by us because he'd been in that movie Slacker. Mm. Ever seen that? 1990? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later? Uh, yeah. Alex is in there going around with his megaphone in, in Austin, Texas, you know, way back then. So, uh, uh, so we got him as a guest on our show. Yeah. And during the, com I'm calling in from New York. I was living in New York and I had been on the radio with this guy in Toronto years before, but now we're in, I'm in New York calling in. I'm co-host and we have Alex. So in the commercial break, Alex and I are both on the phone and uh, we start talking mm -hmm. and I started explaining him my concept of the Android meme. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know what I meant, but I was semi McLuhan talk, you know, all this different stuff while the advertising is going on and and we are talking over the advertising but we kind of don't realize what it means and when when the commercials ended and we came back on the show live we got informed by my co-host that uh, we got a problem here bob you guys talked over the commercials uh, the manager doesn't like this you've ruined the commercials of the people who paid for that right yeah yeah <laughs> and, and so alex and i that's my first encounter uh, with uh, with Alex, we destroyed the for a couple minutes the Android meme. Uh, so then he invited us on his show a week or two later, and we were on it. And uh, I kept continuing my talk, and he kept translating me, saying, "Well, what do you what what are you saying, people? What Bob's saying? Blah blah blah. He get it all wrong." And he just piled on one misinterpretation of what I was saying. So I recognize he doesn't have a very good conceptual mind. Yeah, you know, he's just a. I ranter. think he admits he admits that though. He's yeah, said yeah. Before. He's not a philosopher, you know. No. He's a he's a paranoid or something, you know, <laughs> a, a paranoid uh, pundit. Patriot. Pundit? I don't know. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to say pundit. That's sort of a harsh word. But yeah, he's he's but, uh, he said before, like he said about the planets aligning and stuff before. But he always admits afterwards, like I don't, he doesn't really get it. Like I think he, right. I think he's intuitively under like gets it, but he can't explain it or something. I don't know. Yeah, he, he like doesn't nice. have quote the education or whatever to conceptualize it properly. Okay, uh, but anyway, so he did a watered down version of us on the show, and then we never talked to him again. He didn't ask us back, and then uh, he's doing nine one one truther. And so by the end of the that decade, by two thousand ten, he's big. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And uh, but we weren't involved with him anymore. But you can go. Uh, my friend of mine said they found the recording of that show. And you can go on there and hear me and Alex uh, talking over the commercial. So I'll try to find that for you. Okay. And, uh, okay. Listen. To but but what I did was uh, in the eighties mm. is I presented. You know David Icke when his books came out. Yeah. It was mm. he listened to my show. He had all the same sources in his footnotes. Right. Executive Health Review, May Brussel, a whole bunch of people that I popularized in mm. the eighties. So. Do you, but you I was. Are you in agreement with David Icke? No, I, I, I'm not a fanatic. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a poet. I'm a musician. I, I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm not uptight about the fallen. And you learn a lot of that from Ion. Mm -hmm. Ion says, stop worrying about people. You know, they're stupid. And some they're going to get it, and the others uh, aren't. And it's not a problem. They die. They're still is in that is that case you know of, what I mean? Is that a case of free will, or does that just happen? What, what whether or not some get it or some die you know is there is there a choice we can make oh no yeah you make a choice it's up to you you know the law of attraction yeah one two three ion says it should be uh three two one three you imagine or or declare something you want yeah you then don't visualize and put all this effort in to try to get it happening you let it lie and let non-physical, your non-physical, make it happen for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's two. And then three, no, one. So it goes three, state what you want. Mm -hmm. Two, it's it's brought to you. Yeah. And then one, you decide whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you do it again. So choice is at the core of how you live. Three, two, one. If you want it, you, you can use choice. So, yes, uh, I says every death is a suicide. Every death. So it's uh, like I was an expert on the John Kennedy assassination. Mm. But when I first asked Ian about it, I said, uh, so who killed Kennedy? That's said one of my first talks because my first question, because when Ian came through, but I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I then uh, said, well, OK, I could ask questions. And I said, OK, I uh, well, he wasn't called Ian then. 
I said, okay, whoever I'm talking to, uh, let's start with the traditional question, who killed Kennedy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I thought he'd go through the whatever, some familiar stuff, but he says he did. Okay. You're going to have to explain this to me again, I think. Oh, I will. But let me, let me, okay. let me. I'll let you finish. So he goes, he did. I said, there's a pause. And I go, what do you mean he did? And I says, every death's a suicide. So he killed himself? Yes. Well, what about all the other people who actually shot at him and all yeah. that stuff? He said, they facilitated his suicide. Okay. They, they let it happen or they helped it happen, which makes it ambiguous about who's doing what to whom, right? You make the decision to kill yourself, but you might have others help you do it because you can't really do it. So you, you do some shit that gets you in trouble, like the Bay of Pigs and, and all that stuff that he did. Uh, you, um, not he didn't do the Bay of Pigs, he resisted it. I he see, wanted to so you mean in general over, over a time what? span? You mean gen in general over a time span in quotation marks? Yeah. Certain he, actions he, he work on a here. certain actions work on a sort of subconscious or unconscious, non-material level, which which arrive you at a certain point, which you've predestined. Right. Okay, he but what? But, but, but what? I guess what I'd say because obviously, huh? hold it. He pissed off J. Edgar Hoover, yeah, who was the main guy behind it. Okay, so here he is. He he hates his father. He hates being president. He's got a bad back. He's all fucked up. And he wants to get out of the pain, but he can't fucking kill himself. He just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So he creates situations where he's killed. And, mm -hmm. and Ayn says that's ultimately suicide. But he so doesn't he say? doesn't sort of consciously recognize that's what he's doing, right? But that is right. okay. Look at Duchamp, man. He was so cool. He he came to America from the teens and he always could get out of he didn't have to fight in the war. I mean, this is sort of the Gurdjieff example though, of things just yeah. happen, no one does anything, right? No one's awake. They're just getting pulled along by the cogs. So, I mean, I guess right. it's just uh, tough to use that specific example. But, I mean, it applies to every time that people get caught up in things is that there's like just you're just asleep and you're not making these like you're not a, a witnessing objective reality. You're not awake enough to be like, well, hang on, I'm getting drawn into something. So by doing that, it's like it is a choice that you you die, but you, you still think you're completely conscious. You're just not a you're not awake. Right. Yeah, you're not using your potential to make choices so you don't get trapped. Okay, Okay. so you're an average working Joe who thinks they have to have three meals a day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't occur to you, maybe, like monks, you know, withdraw, have a low income, don't have to buy the car and all that stupid consumer stuff, live real smart like Gary Snyder the poet did, live on little, and then meet people. You have a community, you can crash at different places, and you move around the world. You have a better life, which a lot of yeah. baby boomers did in the 50s, 60s, traveling around the world with this uh, camaraderie. Uh, that was uh, available then. The um, So you don't have to be what society says you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be a, a dumb working guy or a working woman. Uh, you got a lousy marriage, get the hell out of it. But we know that people were conditioned by the print environment, the dark age of following books and uh, all the stupid rules that were happening in that two or 300 year period, very centralized bureaucratic life, you know? Yeah. So, but before that, people traveled all over the world in the middle ages, you know? They, did, they weren't locked down to industrial structures. So anyways, if you're smart and lucky and meet somebody who inspires you, you'll start to make your life choices smarter and not be controlled by your body and your senses and stupid stuff. Right? Yeah. That's, that's no, fully we're agree. Hipsters, right? We're hipsters. We do that. <laughs> oh, man. Big stuff. Big stuff. I'm glad you but, appreciate it. Yeah. But wake, you know, the problem is, is uh, you can't draw a horse to water, right? You can't drag a horse to water. Right. It, that, that, that's where it all starts is there has to be something which you know, you like that film falling down, right? One day, you something flicks and you just cannot do the modern world anymore. And unless you have that, and then, and I think the bigger thing is for a lot of people, like it does click every day. They're like, I'm sick of this, but they don't, yeah. they don't admit to it. You know, push it back down. Oh no, this yeah. is normal. This is how things are going to be. I'm meant to be happy. If I'm not, then I'll take some pills. They don't admit to it, so you can't. You know, as try as hard as many people might. You can't drag a horse to water. That's the most difficult thing. It's impossible. That's the only impossible thing. Yeah, you. Yeah, Ian's very down on uh, sort of trying to be motivated to help people. You can't help anybody unless you got your shit together and you have something to give. If you don't have anything to give and you put all your energy into helping people, even though you haven't really got your own life 
properly motivated or driven, energized, you end up running out of energy and then being used by people. And so Ion has this line about marriage. Um, he says, uh, if you meet somebody and uh, you get along or something, he says, just say, I like you, you like me, let's live together and see what happens. And then you have the principle that I will not make you happy and you will not work, live to make me happy. You figure out how to be happy and do what you want to do with me as a partner. That's different. Everybody thinks marriage is making the other person happy, right? Well, usually it's the opposite, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's the opposite because they don't know that, you, that you're interfering with the other person if you're trying to make them happy. If you accept that you're both happy and you do it your own way, then you don't have that interrupting your relationship. And, and the ideal model of that is, it's say, artists. You know, people who have their own independent careers and they're uh, open-minded, they're cool, and they don't rely on each other to have meaning. They, they have their own art to do. So we romanticize artists. It's a whole different world now, but uh, that's the traditional thing about uh, the, the hero of the artist. And uh, so I like that. I like what Ian says. There's no other gurus who say that. They just go on about divine self and this and that. They don't give you that practical point and counterintuitive that you're not there in a married relationship or a serious relationship, then that to be married, where you're responsible for the other person's happiness. You, you will be happy and enjoy helping people be happy, but it's not your main goal. And I think, I think the millennials and younger, they're so isolated in the little matrix tubes that they're being groomed to live that way, but the society is all screwed up and they don't have the right knowledge and language to do it right. So millennials are aborted. They generally, the myth is they can't talk, they can't socialize in the physical very well. And so they're missing. But what I'm saying and what I am saying, if the young kids heard that, they'd probably be able to figure it out because society moves them to be isolated and to be on their own and do their own creativity and all that bullshit. Uh, but it's all the technology demands because the media makes you, Web 2.0 makes you a creator. Uh, but there's no proper ideology in the larger society to support that. And what Ian says supports that. I, I, I know a lot of young millennials. They hear Ian said, uh, they, Ian says, relationships are not important. And uh, you're not here to make the other person happy. They go, wow, that's what I actually believe. They, they <laughs> like it. Then they go out and try to live it and they fuck themselves up. And then they come back uh, crying. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, that goes back to the concept of like normality, though. You're right. What what we consider normal and the pre-programmed idea of what normal is, is if you go, OK, well, that's normal. Then you do everything to try to achieve the normal, which is usually, you know, buy a big, get a big mortgage that you can't afford, marry someone that you're not too keen on because it's comfortable, have a couple of kids, get two cars on credit, get yourself into a load of debt, buy all the gadgets, blah, 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 blah. And then you finally achieve that last thing, right? You get the nice hot tub that you've wanted for all those years and you go, oh, yeah, I'm still not happy. And you realize right. if you're smart, but most people aren't, they just keep buying until they yeah. die. You realize you go, damn, I never actually questioned what normal is. You know, that's I never, right. I never defined what my own happiness is. And that seems to tie in with what, you know, what Ion's saying and what McLuhan's saying is McLuhan is addressing the systematic programming, which develops these concepts of normal happiness, meaning what life should be. Uh, yeah, McLuhan, listen to this, McLuhan being an expert on everything he wrote, I find a lot of stuff that he said, and people might not know, that supports Ion. And um, and remember, he's the first guy to talk to me through Ion in that hmm. first session, right? Yeah. But he, he explained that literate marriages don't work because there's too much matching going on, trying to uh, adapt each hmm. other's minds and match. Whereas he said, we're in a society where we're making. You make your own identity, you make your own sensory profile, you make your, your livelihood. A making aspect, he said, is the way relationships should happen, is recognizing the, minute, the making rather than matching. Um, I think I had another idea. He, uh, oh, I can't remember it, I'm not gonna get, it'll come back or not. But um, I wanted to say that, that a lot of McLuhan stuff fits uh, what Ion says. And, and Ion says that McLuhan did anticipate more than anybody else the tech body, which is pretty cool. Have you ever heard of Arthur Croker? No. Okay, look him up, K-R-O-K-E-R. -E he was a student of McLuhan and a professor in Canada. 
he wrote the most advanced tech body texts back in the 90s, closest to what the tech body is. And, and I knew him and I appreciated his books, but he got it from McLuhan. And I have interesting dialogues with Ion about comparing Croker to McLuhan, to William Irwin Thompson, to Lynn LaRouche or to Gurdjieff. I, I, I compare all these archetypes uh, in my, and Ion's very knowledgeable on all of them. He says a big factor in McLuhan's life that most people don't realize it was Ezra Pound. Mm -hmm. Not so much Wyndham Lewis. So that's a little hint there. Okay. Look at look at his correspondence with Pound in the late 40s, early 50s. Okay. Um we've uh we've gone <laughs> off on a really we've, we've gone not... off on about an hour digression again, but it's been fun. Uh but I think you know, taking eye on as whatever it is, and I'm not saying either way, you know, respectful of yeah, whatever, you know, say all that stuff. If you want to take it as a metaphor, take it as a metaphor. It's your reality. I'll leave it there. I think either way, as it's addressed, I actually think our discussion on Ion is probably more productive towards what McLuhan was explaining yeah. than going through it academically and sort of ruining it in that academic spiel way of like, oh, this is exactly what he means. Whereas, well, it's constantly changing, right? We're in the tech body, as you say, and it's just a big, massive machine, which is constantly changing. So it's, at any moment, we've got to describe it with the tools we've got at that time. So I think this discussion on Ion is probably more helpful towards McLuhan. But um, is there anything you want to sort of... Uh, I have something. Yep, bring uh, in here at the uh, end. Here. I'm going to send you it, McLuhan's centenary was uh, 2011. Uh -huh. So me and another guy from New Zealand, we had um, seminars every couple of weeks on online talking about McLuhan. We had people involved with McLuhan come on as guests. Well, eventually we brought Ion in mm -hmm. and we would talk to McLuhan and his wife, Corinne. Mm -hmm. So you can go hear what McLuhan says uh, through ION to us. It's all available for you to hear, which was a pretty unique way to do a centenary, right? To have yeah. McLuhan show up and talk. Wow, yeah. And, the best and now, What? The best way. Yeah. And, and then ION said one night uh, that there were two symbols mm -hmm. that were the core of McLuhan's work, mm -hmm. the sun and the moon. Now, I knew about that from his literary criticism. Not that it was the core, but how he used them. But once Ian told me that, and McLuhan confirmed it, you know, within the mediumship, um, I look at his work and I see that. So it's interesting. In the end, he's like a poet or an alchemist, sun and moon, and all that goes with that historically, and then how he used it. So uh, that's one little neat thing that I got from those talks in 2011. I, I leave you with that. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good place to finish up, I think. Yeah, uh, Bob Dobbs. I'll send you the link to that. Yeah, I'll put it in the description. Uh, yeah. yeah, Bob Dobbs, thanks very much. Well, let's continue.